Good morning and welcome to First Lutheran Church where we gather to worship together as God's people. We come together to pray, to sing, to hear God's word, to confess our sins, and to eat a meal together on occasion. We are glad that you are joining us and hope that your life will be blessed by the time that you spend worshiping with us. If you would like myself, Pastor Naomi, or Pastor Jim to come to your home, to your apartment, to your room, please give the church office a call and we'll be more than happy to come and visit you. Thank you for being with us today and God's blessings. Welcome to worship on this beautiful Mother's Day uh, morning and uh, we hold our mothers uh, living and those gone before us and our hearts and prayers on this day. A couple of things to announce. We have the FLCW salad luncheon that's coming up. You can uh, take note of that in your uh, announcements this morning. We also uh, have, will have an announcement for, in just a moment for about our uh, fair uh, sign up that's going on. And take note of the summer worship schedule uh, that's coming up. We have uh, uh, two uh, deaths to announce this morning. Uh, Barbara Berkness has passed away and her funeral is going to be May 21st at Milton Lawns uh, Chapel. And also we're sad to announce the death of Maui Mason Kugelstad. Probably many of you knew uh, Rick and uh, Mary Lynn Mason and her funeral services will be here uh, next Saturday at 11 o'clock. So keep those families in your prayers. Uh, is Randy here gonna make a brief? Oh, you're right there. <laughs> How could I miss you? Thanks, Randy. Good morning. Just wanted to make a brief announcement about our upcoming fair. We have our sign-up board for our workers in the back of church, as we have always done that in the past. This year, we had a committee formed um, to try and see how we could improve our food booth, and we've... Uh, changed the focus of the food booth this year. We are going to use a percentage of our proceeds to benefit one of the ministries that First Lutheran supports. Um, there will be more information coming about exactly which group is gonna, gonna receive some additional help from us. If I could turn your attention to your bulletin, we do have a purple sheet this week, um, which we have an updated day-by-day -day list of what we need for volunteers for both youth and for adults um, and we will continue to update this weekly as we get closer and closer to the fair a lot of times i think people think well they've got plenty of people but we definitely need as many hands as as we can get so we'll be updating that weekly and then also at the bottom of that sheet what we're doing this year is we've we're asking for some donations of soda and water and we've listed exactly what types of soda and water we would like to have donated and if anyone could you know, drop off a case of water or drop off a case of soda at the gym, that would greatly help our mission this year. And we're also keeping an updated list on the bottom um, of the sheet regarding we only need two more cases of Mountain Dew or, you know, one more case of Diet Coke or whichever. So watch for that each week. And we also this week have a uh, envelope in the bulletin if, uh, if you feel you would just like to make a monetary donation to help offset some of the cost in the food booth. We definitely welcome, welcome your donations. Um, I encourage everyone to consider signing up. It's a great time to spend time with other members of the church. You get to meet some of our youth. And if you're a new member, it's a great way to get involved. So I'd like everyone to, to think about it and take a look at the board and see if you have a couple hours that you could offer us. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. This is also Second Harvest Week, so if you have some time on Thursday, um, we can use people of all ages and all levels of mobility and help. Um, we've been a little short the last couple months, and so if you could come and help us at 3 o'clock or sometime after that on Thursday, it would be great. I invite you to stand as we begin our worship with our confession and forgiveness. We do come to this time of worship as we live in the strong and living name of our God in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto each and every one of you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn, our gathering hymn today is an insert. It's printed in the back page of your bulletin.
Service continues on page 147 in the front of our books. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. O oh God, form the minds of your people into one will. Make us love what you command and desire what you promise, that amid all the changes of this world, our hearts may be fixed where true, true joy is found. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
Our first reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Our psalm today is Psalm 47. I will read the lighter print, and if you would read the bolder print with Pastor Jim. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with a joyful sound. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. Who subdues the people under us and the nations under our feet. Who chooses our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom God loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a ram's horn. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is king of all the earth, sing praises with a song. God reigns over the nations, God is enthroned on high. The nobles of the people have gathered as the people of, of God, the God of Abraham. The rulers of the earth belong to God, who is highly exalted. Our second reading is from Ephesians chapter 1. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. So that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all role, rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The next reading is from Acts chapter 1. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the names the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly, Two men in white robes stood by them, and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Thank you, Karen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, no, it's Superman. Remember those lines? They were the introduction to Superman. I mean, the real one, the black and white one on TV, starring George Reeves. Now, for you young folks, uh, George Reeves is not to be confused with the more recent actor, Christopher Reeve. Their names are even spelled differently. But that was my favorite TV show when I was a kid. 
and uh, it ran from back in 1952 to 1958. Obviously, this was one of the first TV series uh, because television then was in its infancy. It was also in the post-World War II period when the jubilation at the end of the war began to cool a little bit as a new threat began to arise, the threat of the atomic bomb and the Soviet Union. It was the beginning of the Cold War with Russia. Just when we thought the world was safe for democracy again, we found ourselves facing a new enemy armed with super lethal weapons against which we felt helpless, although they felt helpless against ours as well. And just like the crowd gathered at the beginning of Superman, Americans turned their eyes heavenward in search of a savior, Superman. It's amazing how pop phenomena and television shows, even on early television, can make Superman actually address our real world fears and problems. Superman represented the ultimate hope of humankind, at least in America. The man of steel was faster than a speeding bullet, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, and most of all, he was a force of good in a world filled with evil. Do you remember what Superman fought for? His slogan on the beginning of that TV series? He fought for truth, justice, and the American way. They don't make superheroes like that anymore. The modern Superman and Batman have a decidedly dark side to them. Maybe we think it's naive to believe in goodness and purity. It's a natural human reaction in times of crisis and fear to look for a savior. It's always been that way. You know, the people of Israel, long before the time of Jesus, had lived in constant anxiety and fear. The natural world was a hostile place to live to begin with, and add to that, they were surrounded by powerful enemies like Egypt, Babylonia, and the Roman Empire. For centuries, this people awaited a savior, a Messiah from God. This is a central theme of the Bible, if not the central theme of the Bible, waiting for God to come and save us. Well, when Jesus finally arrived on the scene, he was identified as the one. The wise men had been looking up at the sky and they determined that he was the Messiah. He was the, and Peter, his disciple, confidently announces, you are the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of the living God. And the rumors and speculations throughout Israel fanned flames of excitement as he went about preaching and teaching and healing, even raising people from the dead and confronting the religious and political powers of the day. And although Jesus affirmed that he was indeed the Messiah, he began dropping clues that he would not be what the people expected or what the people wanted. He would not be a man of steel. He would not be a superman. He would be a frail human being like you and me. And although he seemed to have superpowers, he refused to use them to save himself. And they didn't even need to use kryptonite. Jesus began to prayer, prepare his followers for the inevitability of his death, but they weren't having any of it, as this following excerpt from the Bible shows. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. 
You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And when Jesus was finally uh, nailed to the cross and died, the spell was broken. He had proved to be a failed Messiah if he was a Messiah at all. He didn't lift a hand to save himself. His disciples all went into hiding, a sure sign that they thought Jesus wasn't all that he was cracked up to be, and all of their expectations were shattered. Now here's where we get to our lesson today, the story of Jesus' ascension. The fervor around Jesus was reignited on the third day of the week when the tomb was found empty. Then he began appearing to people, to Mary, to the disciples in a locked room. Finally, he met them in Galilee and even shared a meal with them. And he remained with them for 40 days, we're told. And lo and behold, he tells them, I'm leaving again. One day when they were walking and talking up on a mountainside above Jerusalem, they got another surprise. And as Karen read, Jesus is taken up into a cloud and disappears from their sight. And now we get a kind of look up into the sky in reverse. The disciples are standing, looking up at the air, stupidly, apparently at nothing, when two men dressed in white, which by the way in the Bible is usually code for angels or some kind of heavenly beings, these guys appear and ask them, what are you looking for? Of course, these men know. And they say, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. In other words, they're saying, he's gone. Get over it. Instead of standing staring at the sky, it's time to look around you and get to work. Jesus is no longer with you on this earth, but he's been preparing you for this. Haven't you been listening? However, he has left you something behind. He has left his footprints on earth among you to follow. He has left a mark on this world, and he has left a mark on your hearts. On Mount Scopus in Jerusalem, the mountain from which Jesus is said to have ascended to heaven, there is a small Christian Muslim chapel. Christians and Muslims recognize this as the spot, the very spot from which Jesus ascended. Yes, Muslims believe in Jesus. They just don't believe that he's the son of God. They believe that he was a prophet. But inside of that small chapel is a stone surrounded by a chain fence. In the middle of this raw stone is what can be described as a footprint, if you use your imagination a little bit. This is said to be the exact point from which Jesus ascended. It's Jesus' footprint. Now, I know that some people have found the face of Jesus on the side of a piece of toast, and our faith does not rely on such uh, uh, miracles as this. But that footprint is a nice visual aid, if nothing else. The Bible doesn't speak about it. But there are important footprints of a different kind that Jesus leaves behind. Of the most important things that he leaves behind are his teachings. He said, those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Now that Jesus has left the room, it does not mean that things go back to the way they were before. I remember, being a junior high teacher, the anxiety of having to step out of the room for a minute and leave your classroom unattended to speak to somebody in the hall. Now, in a poorly disciplined classroom, a teacher would be fortunate not to find fatalities when returning to the room. In a well-disciplined classroom, however, you would return to students orderly going about their work unsupervised, for a little while anyway. 
Jesus had taught his followers. They were disciplined. In a related word, they had been discipled. And this is why the church has always been an institution of teaching and learning. We have been disciplined. We have been discipled. One generation of disciples passes Jesus' teachings down to another. That's why we have Sunday school. That's why parents make pledges to educate their children when they're baptized. Confirmation and Bible studies. And it's why we sit here every Sunday morning and let somebody talk at us for 15 minutes, more or less. There is moral knowledge that we need to learn. We learn to be honest. We learn to live with integrity. We hear Jesus' teachings on caring for the poor and the needy, and we follow those through programs like Second Harvest. We look to the Bible in order to learn. We don't just stand around looking up at the sky in prayer, waiting for Superman. Of course, the greatest footprint that he left in our lives is love. In his last days, he put it in the form of a simple and direct commandment. He said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. It's a big ask. He loved us unconditionally. His love was inclusive and forgiving. And as we talked about last week, he didn't put walls around his love. He told us to love our enemies. Now that's a challenge. His love was very forgiving. And most challenge of all, he sacrificed his life for our sake. As Paul says, while we were yet sinners, while we were still messing up, he gave his life for us. Can we follow that commandment to love one another as Jesus loved us? In a word, no. That is, we can't do it on our own. We break commandments all of the time. We fail to love others as we should. We already confessed those things this morning and had to receive forgiveness for them, and we'll do it again next week and the week after that. And that's why something that Jesus said just before he ascended is so important. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. We Lutherans are often accused of not being spiritual enough. And while it's true that our cultural heritage of many of us uh, might, makes us not the most demonstrative people when it comes to our faith, but nothing could be further from the truth about our teachings about the Holy Spirit. Martin Luther said, here's a teaching, Martin Luther said in his explanation of the third article of the Apostles' Creed, I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. I can't even do that. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me by his gifts, and sanctified and preserved me in the true faith in like manner as he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth. And Jesus fulfilled that promise to send the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is a topic for Naomi to deal with next week on the Pentecost Sunday as we celebrate that day, the celebration of the day that the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples and gave birth to the church. But for today, we have been called, enlightened, and sanctified by our faith in Jesus Christ. Just as the people of Israel trembled at the ruthless power of the Roman Empire, just as Americans trembled at the Soviet nuclear menace, so we today tremble at the unbridled evil of ISIS and global terrorism. Today, we hope desperately for a Messiah 
a superman, or even a great American president who will come to save us. But brothers and sisters of Janesville, Wisconsin, do not stand looking idly up into the sky. Look around. Look within. We have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have been empowered to accomplish his work until he returns. He has not abandoned us. He has discipled us. It's all time for all of us to put on our capes, stop looking up into the sky, and get to work. Amen. I invite you to stand as we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Written in the abundant life of, and love of Christ Jesus, we pray for the life of the church, the lives of people in need, and all of creation. God of renewal, fill us to overflowing with the grace we receive in word, in water, in the meal. Draw others to join the life we share in you. Hear us, O oh God. Declare your goodness through the blossoming of creation. By the winds blowing and the birds singing, inspire us to join in the hymn of all creation. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Reveal yourself to those who feel isolated because of illness, grief, status, or the prejudice of others. Comfort and welcome them into your spirit-filled community. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Bless those who serve in a mothering role for others. Send your spirit to those who mourn, those who have not known their mothers, or for those who long to be a mother. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You draw all saints into your presence. Draw us into the mystery and wonder of your presence until Christ comes again. Today we especially remember Molly Mason Pugelstead and Barbara Bjorkness as you draw them to their eternal home. Hear us, O oh God. And now we offer prayers from the silence of our hearts.
Hear us, O oh God. We deliver all our prayers into your care, O oh God. Those prayers that we speak with our lips, those that are written on our hearts, those we can utter only with sighs and all the things you see that we need. For we trust in the work of your Holy Spirit to bring all things into the life of our risen Christ, in whom name we pray. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. I invite you to share a sign of peace with those around you. We now prepare our hearts and our minds for the gift of the meal. And the night before he died, our Lord and Savior took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the Lord's table, and you are all welcome here, for the gifts of God are free. You may be seated.
invite you to stand. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, give you strength and peace today and into your life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, our life, our strength, our food, we give you thanks for sustaining us with the body and blood of your Son. By your Holy Spirit, enliven us to be his body in the world that more and more we will give you praise and serve your earth and its many peoples. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now until we meet again, receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. In his hosting coffee hour this morning. If you're not as afraid of spoiling your appetite, enjoy one of their delicious brownies. Go and feed peace to love and serve the Lord. <laughs>